now. Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we have a book club episode with Father Thomas Joseph White on. He's going to be talking about his new book published within the Catholic University of America Press. It's The Trinity on the Nature and Mystery of the one God. And so we're going to be talking about this episode, this conversation on the Trinity with father white here in a moment. If you go to our show notes, you can click the link to this book and purchase it for yourself. Please do that. Or someone, you know, uh, and then also there's a link to find the closest reformed or confessional churches near your area. So if you click that link, to find a church home, you can uh, type in your zip code and find the closest denominations come up near your area. There's also some information just how to communicate with Peter or myself, uh, where you can find us. T- usually it's Twitter or Instagram, same handle for both at Guilt Grace Pod. You can also find us on YouTube. These conversations are automatically recorded and put on video on YouTube. So hit the subscribe button on YouTube for Guilt Grace Gratitude Podcast. You can also just email us, uh, guiltgracepod at gmail.com. Uh, you heard me mention uh, Logos Bible Software. So they are a bridge builder sponsor for us. Halfway through this episode, so you'll hear some of our other bridge builders. And if you as an individual want to be a bridge builder, please click that Patreon link in our show notes and check out the options there as well. So I'll let Peter further introduce Father Thomas joseph white today yeah we have father thomas joseph white op is the rector of the angelicum at rome and author of the light of christ an introduction to catholicism and the incarnate lord a thomistic study in christology which is also a fantastic book and we'll probably touch on some of these as well Uh, we were sent some of these from catholic university of america press but it's a pleasure having you on father white Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks very much. I'm very honored to be invited. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for yeah coming on and um, writing. We were joking about this this uh, doorstopper of a book, but also a really good book um, nonetheless. So it's I would encourage people to to pick this up. Um, so yeah, maybe to let our listeners, if they're not sure who you are or not sure um, what you've written or what you've done, uh, let our listeners know maybe a little bit about yourself, your background, your current work. Yeah, well, um, so I'm a Dominican priest. The The Dominicans are a religious order of the Catholic Church founded in the 13th century by mm-hmm. St. Dominic from Spain, uh, a contemporary of St. Francis of Assisi. And the most famous member of the order is Thomas Aquinas, yep. who, um, you know, all the brothers typically study his work and some of us promote his thought in a particular way. He's a big influence in my theology mm-hmm. or the theological work I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I've worked a lot in Christology, uh, Doctrine of the Atonement, uh, Trinitarian Theology, Doctrine of Grace, uh, notions about the human person, the human fall, redemption, so classical dogmatic topics. And I teach here in Rome at one of the seven pontifical universities that are for, you know, at the service of the Catholic Church to help form future clergy and Catholic religious, as well as lay people. Uh, I was made the rector of the institution, which is, you know, the Italian word for the the university president about a year ago, Hmm. but I still teach and I'm still writing and researching uh, in my spare time. So that, you know, that's a a short bio. Hmm. Very nice. And just to clear the air for everybody, uh, you are a Catholic priest. There's two reformed guys talking to Catholics. This stuff can happen. Yes, it can. Uh, Catholic priest on our show and we're reformed presbyterians were uh christians or all christians here and even though many of our listeners may question why we're talking to a catholic priest on our show but we believe that there's a lot we can agree on so uh we won't focus or talk about obviously disagreements but what is especially ecumenical about the doctrine of the trinity that we definitely agree on and uh should there be much of a difference among catholics and uh Reformed Protestant Christians, um, when it when we expound on the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's never been 
a major point of contention between the Reformed and the Roman Church on uh, the doctrine of the Trinity yeah. and the confession of the Trinitarian faith in the three-person God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are one in being and nature, is part of the Reformed confessions mm -hmm. of every major branch. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, you know, an uncontroversial aspect of the Apostles' Creed that uh, John Calvin and others who take inspiration from him mm -hmm. maintain as a centerpiece of Christ Christian confession. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you have a classic Reformed uh, sensitivity to divine sovereignty, to uh, salvation by grace, the first initiative of God, God's omnipotence, uh, as well as the divinity of Christ, the incarnation mm -hmm. that God became human, that Christ is truly God and truly man, and that the Holy Spirit has been sent from Christ crucified and resurrected to redeem us, then you have basically, you know, a set of considerations, a set of convictions that are, uh, in essence, very similar to those of the Catholic Church yep. on these matters. Yeah. And even the study of Aquinas, which a lot of the reformers, Protestant reformers, um, scholastics would, we, we would, we would pull much the same stuff from Aquinas ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, so Aquinas obviously comes, you know, hundreds of years before the Reformation. And so the debates that uh, affect the, the the churches after the Reformation era are not as uh, present or affecting his work in the same way. Uh, there are clearly, you know, uh, elements of his thought that a Reformed reader would recognize as traditional Roman Catholic ideas about the mm -hmm. sacraments, mm -hmm. perhaps about justification, although you know, there are some places of rough yeah, yeah, he's... between him on, and Luther on justification. Exactly. But, yeah. You know, but on God, on the doctrine mm -hmm. of God, mm -hmm. uh, most reformed Christians do not find Aquinas controversial. Um, some of them, you know, may traditionally have concerns about his use of philosophy, but the use of philosophy in reformed doctrine of God is also, it's controversial among the reformed among themselves. And so, and many of the reformed scholastics are really close to Aquinas on oh, yeah. the doctrine of God. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's, it's not, uh, you know, a world away, I would say. Totally. Yeah. So, um, and as, as we go through this, we'll, we'll kind of go part by part in this book. And this is, this is part of this Thomistic resourcement series here. We're kind of bringing Thomistic thought into this. Um, so maybe with, maybe to start off even before these questions, what, what, has Aquinas or Aquinas written on the Trinity? Like what, mm. where is it part of his Summa? Um, mm. Why, or like, where, where is this within his Summa? How does, how does he treat this, this doctrine himself? Well, I mean, I think you would want to perhaps just, you'd probably would like to hear first that, you know, Aquinas wrote uh, very substantial commentaries on scripture, not yeah. only some old Testament books, but also gospel of Matthew, gospel of John. Yeah. Prodigious all, exegy, all epistles. Yeah. yeah. And so a lot of his Trinitarian thinking is really present when he um, interprets scripture, but then he draws it into systematic treatments early on in what's called his commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences. He writes hundreds and hundreds of pages there. Then when he, he wrote that when he's 25, he was the youngest person to ever <laughs> write on the, yeah. uh, the commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences, at, uh, which everyone did for the doctrine of theology yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, but then later he writes in, um, uh, important things about the Trinity in the Summa Contra Gentiles. He writes things in the De Potentia Dei, which is on the power of God. And then his mature synthesis is in the famous Summa Theologiae. And there uh, he treats the nature of God first. You might say the divine essence. And that's things like God's eternity, uh, uh, God's wisdom, goodness, power, um, you know, simplicity, immutability. And then he treats the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, and the relations between the persons, the processions and the relations in God's life. These are all classic topics from the earliest strata of ecclesial theology from like St. Augustine yep. onward. Yep. You have people thinking about these things. So he treats the nature of God and then the persons of God, but it's all one treatise. You might say in Latin, De Deo ut uno, God as one, and De Deo ut trino, God as three. And they're supposed to be examined together because you're studying the, the mystery of God's life and essence in order to think about that shared life and nature of the one God, the Trinity, since, since the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one in nature or one in essence. Yeah, and you use those two phrases, amongst other things, all throughout the book. Yeah, the, the, the Deo ut uno and then the Deo 
Utrino. I, I, yeah. I, 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 Deo de Deo Utrino. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and maybe maybe to to ground it, I, I think Nick had a question just to ground our listeners on like what. But yeah, Nick, if you want to ask some of your questions before we get into kind of the meat of this. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple. I'm sure we're going to cover some of it, but I think that, um, well, I'll just pull one out here. Um, eternally, uh, before creation, there was God in the Trinitarian relationship and love with each other in himself. So there was that, that um, relationship within the Trinity before creation. Why is it crucial for understanding of actually how he reveals himself in creation and through scripture and, and even scripture yeah. as, as the Trinity. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> there's a really early debate in, in Christianity around the third century AD between modalists mm -hmm. and uh, what we could call the, the first fathers of Trinitarian theology and the modalists um, like Sibelius basically said, look, we have a revelation of God in Jesus Christ, who is God and man, but we don't really know what that reality is eternally. What we know is we call that reality Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm. but that's our way of thinking about the reality. What God is in himself is totally beyond us. Now, that's a very tempting way of thinking for mm -hmm. a human being with limited knowledge. It's also a tempting way of thinking for a, a modern human being who says, you know, this is something people came up with in time, but who can really say, uh, I believe Jesus is God. I believe God is in Jesus, but I don't know what the Trinity is or if there really is a Trinity. But what the ancient church said is, no, look at part of the way God saves us that's central in saving us by grace is that God communicates to us true knowledge of who God is. And so if in Jesus we have found God, if he's really as, you know, they say in the Gospels, Emmanuel, God with us, as in the Gospel of Matthew, then we have found God, or he has come to us by mm -hmm. grace. And so when we are, when it's revealed to us that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what is being revealed to us is who God is eternally. Now, the logical consequence of that, that we really know who God is in himself eternally, is that we know the God who is and who would have been Trinity, had he, even had he never created us. Obviously, we only know him because we know him through his revelation and, mm. you know, in another way, you know, through his creation, through, you know, nature that's created by God. Mm -hmm. But we don't we don't uh, misapprehend who God is. You know, this is a, mm. a point of theology that's really fundamental, that yeah. God is not playing with us in the divine revelation or hiding from us in his essence. He's yes, the revelation implies obscurity. Yep. Faith has obscurities to it. But. The faith is also a light that allows us to know the inner life of God, the Trinity, and so we really can confess who God is. Hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll get we'll dip into the, some of that stuff too, and that's actually a pretty good uh, um, kind of bridge into this next question because part one, so you have four parts of the book. So part one, you cover the development of Trinitarian doctrine um, through the creeds, through Scripture, uh, through kind of the earlier Trinitarian thought. So maybe if in brief form i guess as brief as you can summarize 180 pages or however long part one is um how does the doctrine develop through both responding to heresy and mm -hmm. codifying through um some various ecumenical councils and maybe who are some major figures and major councils that you cover yeah okay well you know that's a good question it's also a huge question so yeah. let me just try to <laughs> yeah I'll give you a postcard version and sketch some key Perfect. touchstones. Yep. Right. So the first thing is, obviously, we start with the revelation given in Scripture and in the apostolic teaching. Yep. Um, so I look at the Old Testament as, the you know, revealing the one God who's understood by Israel to be the true creator of the world mm -hmm. and some of the divine attributes of God that are revealed in the Old Testament Scriptures. And then the way that the understanding of the God of Israel is... Uh, developed in the New Testament when the confession of the faith of the apostles is that the God of Israel has become human. Uh, that's to say that the Father has sent his word uh, into our human nature. The word became flesh and dwelt among us in the language of the prologue of John, mm -hmm. or that Jesus Christ, the man, is also the pre-existing Son of God. By pre-existing, I mean he existed as Son before he became human. 
Yep. We have come to know in him the eternal son of the father, the eternal son of God, God from God, light from light, as the creed will later say. So, you know, the first thing is to show that in a, in a kind of polyphonic way, not in simple conceptual terms that are monotonous, but in a polyphonic way, the New Testament teaches that Christ is Lord mm -hmm. and God, and that the Holy Spirit it does things that are pertain to God, and is the Holy Spirit has features in the New Testament that are per pertain to the God of Israel. So the New Testament reveals that the one God of Israel is also Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are truly distinct from one another. Mm -hmm. They're not simply uh, repeated words for one person. Mm -hmm. Now we basically have the seeds of Trinitarian theology because we have a confession of one God who's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are truly distinct, but are somehow one in day, distinct in person, but one. Now that technical language, you know, distinct three distinct persons who are one in being or essence or nature or deity, different words for the same thing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't just you know spring up initially, no. but the New Testament has to be read and interpreted, and what you see is. There were different strategies for explaining this, depending in part on the controversies that arose. Yeah. So just to touch on a few of the major figures, I mean, the first great figures are like Justin Martyr and Irenaeus of Lyon in the second mm -hmm. century. And they're trying to explain the divinity of Christ to the pagan world on the one hand, the Greco-Roman world. And they're saying, you know, there's only one God, not a, not there's not polytheism, but the word of God has become human. In, in God eternally, there is logos, or reason, the mm -hmm. word that's within God imminently. He has spoken into our world, and he sent his Holy Spirit uh, to inspire the prophets with rational religion, reasonable religion that puts to death the old ways of polytheism. So that's a kind of idea I call it monological subject. The Father's the subject who in his word and his uh, inspirational spirit has spoken into the world, because they're speaking more to monotheistic Jews and to polytheistic uh, Greco-Roman pagans. But then you get Irenaeus, who's thinking about how we're saved by the incarnation uh, against Gnostics who deny the incarnation, mm -hmm. basically early Christian heresy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there he's emphasizing the work in the economy of the three persons. The father works in his word and he sends the spirit upon the church. That's how we often think, you know, kind of dispensationally or covenantally that the mm -hmm. father has sent the son into the world yep. then they've sent the spirit that's common to them so that's a more economic way of thinking and yep. those are both valid ways of thinking one yep. is more mono singular subject like the father working in his word and his spirit the other is like the economy of the father sending the son and their spirit that's common to them and mm -hmm. so then it creates the kind of theoretical problem what is god in himself eternally and then you know later that you get these different positions that emerge and, you know, the most important thing happens when basically in the fourth century, Arius, who's kind of the archetypal, you know, <laughs> yeah. heresy. Yep. Uh, he's inventor, Mr. Her yeah, he's Mr. Church. Heretic. Yeah. He, yeah. I mean, Arius says, look, look, fellows, there's one God. So mm -hmm. it must be the father and the son and the spirit must be created. Yep. And that generates the Arian crisis. Um, yeah, there was a there was a time when the sun was not. It was like because because there mantra. was a time when the sun was not. That's the famous phrase of Arius, denying the, that Christ is God, saying that Christ is a mere creature. That's a position, by the way, you find today in in sectarian uh, literature like the Jehovah's Witnesses, yep. and it actually has a kind of you might say a noble pedigree <laughs> in the ancient <laughs> yeah. church. You know, yeah, it's but, it's old, um, but it's not good. It's old, but it's extremely falsifying. You know, it falsifies yeah. the gospel. So then, you know, so then that's when you get the Council of Nicaea in, uh, you know, 325, which basically affirms the divinity of the Son, the divinity of the Word. And then you have to start thinking about what's the, what we call the imminent life of the Trinity. What is it for God to eternally beget the Word, which is on the first page of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was from God, mm -hmm. and the Word was God. And it says in you know John 1.14, uh, he's the eternally begotten Son who became flesh. So if he's the eternally begotten Son, what is this eternal, and Word, what is this eternal begetting? Because it's not mm -hmm. physical, material yep. begetting. Not like what we think of, like Father begetting Son or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's much more like something that happens in the human being immaterially, spiritually, when we have thoughts or beget spiritual thinking but of course we're not talking about mere human thoughts that are so ephemeral and fragile which can come and go and come into being we're talking about the eternal wisdom of the father 
who begets his word eternally communicates all that he has to the son uh, without ceasing to be God. So the son is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the eternally begotten word and wisdom of the father in whom he has made all things. And this is the origins of what's then called in fourth century, hmm. what we can call in fourth century literature, the analogy or the likeness from a similitude to the human mind and the human will that the father eternally begets his son as wisdom and word, like mm -hmm. thinking or intellectual life. And he spirates the spirit as the love he has in common with the father and the son, mm -hmm. like the human being who can first knowing someone spiritually love them spiritually, uh, or in knowing ourselves, we can rightly love ourselves. You know, it's knowledge precedes love. And so the begetting of the word precedes the spiration of the spirit. And this is the mature vision of St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. He works out in the 4th and 5th century in the De Trinitate, uh, his mm -hmm. great work on the Trinity. You know, so there's a development there. It's not an invention of the Trinity. Exactly, that's a, yeah. That, yeah. That's, the, mm -hmm. that's a key thing. Yep. We did not invent the doctrine of the Trinity. We articulated the doctrine to give expression to what is contained exactly. uh, clearly in the yep. New Testament but to put our minds at use in understanding the divine revelation more deeply, meditating on it. And we do that to deepen our living relationship with the Trinity, with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's not a mere verbal exercise or even a safeguarding of the divinity, of the confession of the divinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's even more, it's a, you know, it's a spiritual itinerary. We confess God so that in faith we can know God and love God and enter more deeply into fellowship and discipleship. Mm -hmm. That's, and yeah. Sorry, before Peter jumps in his question, um, there's uh, a couple, there's a part in your conclusion of your book that was really helpful on, on what you're just saying too. And so I'll just read it real quick. Um, the beginning of your, towards the beginning of your conclusion, you say pre Nicene patristic traditions going back to John one, one to three, and is rightly understood as an essential element of the early church's confession of the Trinitarian faith. And then you later go on to say the eternal processions of the persons in God and the temporal missions of the son and the spirit who come into the world reveal the Trinity. I really liked those two parts and it kind of go went off of what you're just saying as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then part, part two, see, we we're kind of talking about the, not we're, we're not kind of making up the trinity out of nowhere we're just yeah we're we're using this language to better understand what the trinity already is and so you you introduce aquinas or aquinas actually how do you say aquinas? is it aquinas or do you say aquinas aquinas thomas aquinas, aquinas. aquinas. Okay. in italian he's from a place called aquino that's right so it's tommaso d'aquino in you know Aquinas. In Italian, but Aquinas in English, yeah. Gotcha. Say it with an Italian accent, Aquinas. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. So I'll say Aquinas. Yeah. Um, it, you, you introduce him in a more substantive way <laughs> in part two, and you cover the mystery of the divine nature using his, um, using the Dedeo, Dedeo uh, Utuno as your primary kind of um, kind of jump off point with this. So what, what is so significant about some of the work that, that Aqu Aquinas does on this? And what doctrines does he help us? Because you kind of specifically talk about some certain doctrines. What what doctrines does he cover, and how does it help us better understand our Trinitarian God? Yeah, so there's an old caricature of Aquinas on the subject of God's nature, which says, well, he just does a treat, you know, creates a treatise on the divine nature or essence divorced from the Trinity. Yeah, exactly. And that's a that's a completely fabulous and unbelievable interpretation which has now been shown by five different ways uh through modern scholarship to be uh imprecise and, and misleading aquinas is studying the divine nature because it's right there in the council of nicaea that the father and the son are in the greek homoousius or one in essence uh mm -hmm. the word in latin is sometimes consubstantialis you know consubstantial this is totally central to reformed confessions as well as catholic exactly. and orthodox yep. confessions that there's one god and the it's a unity of nature or divine nature. But what is the divine nature? So here, there's two ways you can go that are erroneous. One is to say, uh, yeah, we can know nothing of the divine nature. It's just mm -hmm. a bunch of philosophical hullabaloo. We don't know anything about what God is. And that's the way, really, of agnosticism. And it's dangerous for Christians because, yeah. first of all, it's a kind of despairing, pessimistic view of the human mind, which God created. He created yep. our minds to know him. 
But the other side is a kind of hubris or presumption. Oh, yeah, I got the divine nature covered. Hmm. I have that all figured out. Uh, it's just like so lodged in my brilliant, you know, created mind that I can look right into the essence of God. Yeah. Uh, and Aquinas purposely chooses a middle way. We can know something of what God is, and we can say a lot about what God is not. And so we enter into a mixture of light and shadows or of, you know, understanding and of mystery. And he sets out to uh, study what he, uh, uh, the divine attributes or the names of the divine, as he calls them, the names of God. Uh in a multi multifarious way that's very very beautiful very spiritual mm -hmm. he starts with divine simplicity you know mm -hmm. because god is not a body he's not a physical material thing not that and he's just a simple god but yeah he's not made of parts or anything like that it's not simple in the sense of mentally simple or like uh you know psychologically simplistic it means like he's not made of physical parts he's not composite the way a human animal is uh and and he's not dependent for his being on another so he's not created so it's a way of unthinking what we know about things to think about what we don't know about God. Yeah, it's that what the it's the apophatic approach, which I think yeah, has been misused yeah. more recently. Like in modern theology, I think people think apophatic is like, well, you can't talk about God. It's like, no, it's actually the things that we negate that's not God. Right. So exactly. So it's apophatic, meaning negative theological discourse about how God must be unlike created dependent yeah. things and material things. But you're already approaching God that way in some real sense, mm. even if in darkness. So then, you know, he goes on from there to talk about God's perfection, which is obviously positive, mm -hmm. and talk about God having uh, the plenitude of spiritual perfection that uh, must be at the origins of created reality. And then he goes on to talk about things like divine goodness, uh, God's infinity, his eternity, his immutability. And immutability here doesn't mean God's loveless or he's emotionally cold. It yep. means God is eternally God. He's not improving or deteriorating over time. It's not like when he creates, he suddenly goes through an evolution and becomes yeah. a more compassionate, humane God. Or as he goes from the Old Testament, the New Testament, he becomes a much more loving person. Mm -hmm. You know, God is eternally who God is in his mm -hmm. divine perfection. And, you know, he talks about God's eternal wisdom is, and truthfulness. God cannot lie. He cannot deceive us. He is himself the truth and, and God's eternal love. So these are things that you want to say of all three persons in 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 and that they're and that characterize them in their not only equality as equally God, but their identity mm -hmm. as each being the one God. So just as the Son eternally is begotten of the Father, he receives from the Father to be, mm -hmm. you know, eternally God. Uh he's you know, perfect, it, um, immutably mm -hmm. divine. So it's not just true of the Father of these things. It's true of all yeah, three yeah. persons of the Trinity. Exactly, exactly. So to, to worship the Son, to worship the Holy Spirit, to worship Jesus as Lord, or to worship the Holy Spirit, you have to be able to say these things, or else you're practicing idolatry. But if we're not practicing idolatry when we worship Christ as Lord or worship the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. it's because they share the divine nature in common with the Father. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, yeah. And so, and you go further into this in part three, you write on the communion of the persons of the Trinitarian Godhead, um, drawing upon, again, Aquinas on his De Deo Trino. Um, so how, how do you help readers understand the relations? What, and maybe two, what is a relation? Because I, I think it's really helpfully defined in your book of the tri triune persons. And how does that relate? How do their relations kind of display divine unity also? Yeah, so um, the classic category for thinking about the Trinitarian persons from the 4th century AD onward is, is that of relations. You find this in uh, Gregory of Nazianzus and Basil the Great, the Cappadocian Fathers in the mm -hmm. East, and you find it in St. Augustine in the West. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea of relations of origin. So relations of origin are like relations that emerge from an action and what in Aristotelian discourse we call passion or undergoing something. So, um, you know, take a graphic example of a, a, a surgeon in uh, incising with a scalpel into the anesthetized body of a patient, right? Somebody's acting and somebody's undergoing something. Mm -hmm. Or think about uh, a mother who has given birth to a child. The child is begotten of the mother. So there's a relationship of the begetter and the beget the begotten. And mm -hmm. the father is also a begetter of the child. So you have the parent-child relationship as a begetting and a begotten relationship. Now, these are very physical, material images. I'm yeah. speaking of things purposefully that are very human. But if you also think about our thoughts, 
there's relations that arise. Like I'm thinking of something in my, in my thought is now related as originating from me and is directed to something else. Or I love someone and my spiritual love for the other person, my decision to be a loving friend to another person in, you know, justice, affability, and so forth uh, in friendship is a kind of relatedness of the heart. So what the tradition does is it, it says that if we want to think about sameness of being, sameness of nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so total equality and identity of divine essence, but distinction of persons. We can think about it through relations of origin. The Father mm -hmm. eternally begets the Word. The Word is thus related to the Father mm -hmm. as as God, as the Son from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, action, and you might say passion or undergoing, begetting, not physical, but immaterial. And yet the Son has from the Father all that the Father is as God. And then the Father and the Son spirate the Holy Spirit as their mutual love, uh, spiritual love. And in that sense, the spirit is related to the father and to the son as originating from them as from one principle. And yet the spirit is himself also truly God. So each person can be thought of as a processional relation. That is to say the word proceeds eternally from the father and therefore is related to him. The spirit proceeds from the father and the son and is therefore related to him hmm. and to the, to the spirits related to the father and to the son. Yeah. But each of them is also truly God. And it's this idea of being processional relation and being truly God from God, having the plenitude of the divine nature that allows us to begin to fathom the idea of a Trinitarian person. Hmm. Now that sounds very, it's abstract, but what's cool about it on a concrete level is the idea that before we were persons, before the creation of human beings and angels as persons, there's the primal personal communion in God mm -hmm. of the one God who is personal communion in all he is. And that to be personal in God is to be relational substantially or subsistently. All that the Father is is relative to the Son. All that the Son is is relative to the Father. All that the Father and Son have and are is relative to the Spirit they spirate. All that the Spirit has is relative to the Father and the Son. So, like, we become more relative. You know, people who get married to each other mm -hmm. uh, become very dependent on each other, very relative to each other in good times, difficult times. Yep. And they grow in virtue. They become more perfectly loving or the challenge to try totally. and they become very totally. relative to their children you know so you, we be, we enter into a relationship but it's not essential to us you don't hmm. have to grow in a relational mm -hmm. way but but the persons of trinity just are relational in all they are yeah they don't they grow in it they just the, are it they yeah. are it and they are it in having the one essence so like we're never one in being spouses who marry don't become one in being you're not one in being with your father or with your children but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are spiritually one in being, in, in, a, in not in a material way, but in an unfathomable divine way that's immaterial. So there's some kind of personal communion uh, that's of, of wisdom and love that's at the origin of being. Everything that is in creation has come forth from the eternal communion of wisdom and love that's in the Trinity. And we don't know that reality that well. We know it because the Trinity sent the, the son into the world and sent the holy spirit from the father and the son from the cross and from the resurrected christ so that we could begin to understand who god is mm -hmm. and enter into a relationship with god in faith hope and charity in this life and anticipate what the trinity is to invite us to gaze upon the trinity and hope to see the trinity but we we be can begin already to fathom something of the perfection of trinitarian life through the revelation Hmm. That's helpful because uh, we we understand those the three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit are God, but we aren't polytheists. We still believe in one divine God. Yeah, obviously. Now, so then there's two errors. You know, you can go the Sabellian way and say, yep. well, if there's one God, they can't really be three persons. There's just got to, they've got to appear as three persons. Yeah. And that's the ancient heresy of Sabellianism. It denies the distinction of persons. And then you've got the other way, which is a kind of tritheism that is present in some modern theology, at least there's a tendency to it in some modern theology to say, well, there are three divine persons who have a nature similar. I mean, they're, they're three substances, three beings who cooperate together in one society, rather like, you know, Peter, um, James and, and John on Mount Tabor, you know, all sharing the same human nature, but not being one in being. And then you get a kind of social Trinitarianism where you cease really to be a monotheist 
And so the threading, threading the needle of the mystery is always between those two errors. You don't want to go toward tritheism and you don't want to go towards a, a non-Trinitarian monotheism, which is basically what, you know, in the Protestant tradition you call the heresy of Unitarianism. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be Unitarianism and you don't want to be a tritheist, right? Yeah. And so the Quran claims that Christians are tritheists. And yeah. we don't want to we don't want to say that's true. That's definitely yeah. not true. Yeah. It's not a real understanding of Trinitarianism. But Unitarians also claim that, you know, similarly we're trying to tritheists. So you, you know that these are the the kind of extremes we want to avoid. Yeah. 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 And I think like you talk about in your book, I think so often relations are misunderstood that like it doesn't it doesn't show forth the divine unity nor show how not that they gain di divinity through these relations, but they show forth their divinity versus showing forth that they're created or begotten in any sense. And I, I think it was it's a really good corrective that your book kind of explains some of these like relations and processions of the Trinity. Yeah, well, what you don't want to say is that God started off a Unitarian yeah. God, and then he became through the eternal begetting of the son or through the incarnation, he became uh, differentiated uh, so that that would be a kind of ec radical economic Trinitarianism, which is, is fashionable and, yeah. and is present in some Protestant theology yeah. today, yeah. where, you know, God becomes Trinity through time or is evolving into a Trinity. Uh, now, Hegel is, you know, I was about to a, say, a it's like it's a kind of Hegelian, religion, but yeah, yeah. He Hegel says this very overtly that God is becoming Trinitarian and there are some experiments like this in contemporary uh, Protestant dogmatics, um, and that's been going on for some some time now. Moltmann doesn't think God becomes a Trinitarian, but becomes Trinitarian precisely, but he does think God's essence, well, God's Trinitarian life is definitely mutating, and and God is on the way to becoming uh, a Trinity in a certain sense. Yeah. So on the view that I'm presenting, which is far more classical, yep. common to both Protestants and Catholics, yep. as well as Eastern Orthodox, of course. Uh, the Trinity is eternal and immutable in the sense that God is just just is Trinity, and therefore those processional relations constitute what God is eternally, and not mm -hmm. because of God creating or God uh, sending the Son and the Spirit into the world. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's extremely helpful. I mean, it's, to be on and those who are listening, it was it is the best explanation I've ever read on relations processions, and it really kind of. You kind of sync that up for me a little bit, uh, understanding that. Uh, and so your your last part, you cover the economy of the Trinity as it relates to both creation and Christology. And you begin with probably for me the most like fascinating, maybe paradigm shifting chapter on is there such a thing as the economic Trinity? You begin with that chapter, utilizing your research, and we'll talk about some of this. How how should we talk? about the Trinity as it relates to both of these things and, and what is the economic Trinity? What's the kind of ontological, like what's, what happens if we so separate some of these things to our Trinitarian doctrine? Yeah. Okay. So what I do there in that beginning of the fourth part is try to lay out respectfully. And I think, you know, accurately, although it's, yeah. this is obviously controversial about interpret, you know, uh, in regard to interpretation, what happens in two great, 20th century figures, one Protestant, one Catholic, that being Karl Barth and Karl Rahner, respectively, mm -hmm. um, regarding Trinitarian theology. And they're both progenitors of a kind of new paradigm of Trinitarian thinking. Uh, and I think Barth is more the origins of it. And then Rahner takes it and th synthesizes it and explains it in a yeah. slightly uh, more thematic and simpler way, but very powerfully. And basically, the idea is this, that in some sense, Barth suggests in his early work and then follows through it on it programmatically in his later work that when god reveals himself to us as trinity in revealing himself he's also in a certain sense perfecting or becoming his own trinitarian life that's to say god is you might say crystallizing as trinity in real time as he hmm. reveals himself in the incarnation and the sending of the spirit mm -hmm. and then he goes on in his doctrine of election which is a, obviously of a Calvinistic origin. I mean, Catholics yeah. believe in election, but they have a totally. different way of saying, yeah. talking about it. Yep. But in his in his re 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 reprise of Calvin on election, Bart suggests that in a certain sense, through the activity of electing, God is self constituting as Trinity. At least this is a this is a debatable way of reading Bart, which I think is a very defensible one. So now sense. you have a God in a certain way unfolding as God and becoming Trinity or mm -hmm. self defining as Trinity. In virtue of creation, election, creation, incarnation, redemption, and what Bal what 
Rahner puts this in a gentler and more ambiguous way by saying the imminent trinity, let's say who God is eternally, yep. is the economic trinity. Yep. God, as he's unfolding in time through revelation, through incarnation, through the sinning of the spirit. And Rahner leaves it a little ambiguous, so there's different ways to interpret him. And it's given rise to enormous diverse theories, an enormous diversity of theories that have been interesting and fruitful about how the Trinity is revealed in the economy, but in another sense, how in the economy of the sending of the Son into the world, the sending of the Spirit into the world, is the Trinity potentially constituted or changed, enriched, uh, altered, or redefined? And you have a, a variety of positions that emerge among both Protestant and Catholic thinkers, especially in the Germanic world in the mm -hmm. 20th and 21st century. So I lay that out, and then I say, look at this whole disjunctive between an imminent trinity of who God is in himself and an economic trinity of who God is in time with us and the problem of how to resolve all these things, I think is just a problematic distinction. Yeah, It's not a classical distinction, and I don't think we need it to do the work we want to say the real to treat the real question, which is, how is the Trinity revealed in the economy? Yep, yep. And so I go back to the classic distinction of St. Augustine that's followed through on by Aquinas, which is the classic distinction between processions and missions. Exactly. Yep. There are eternal processions in God. The procession of the Son and Spirit eternally from the Father are not constituted by God's relation to the creation. But then God sends, that's the nature of the word mission, he sends the Son into the world first in illuminating the prophets and then in sending him in human nature and in the resurrection, making him present to us in his human nature and his deity, and then sending the Holy Spirit into the world from, from, the, from the Son, through the Son. And in that sense, the, trin the Trinitarian processions, who God is eternally in his processional life, is revealed in the sending and in the missions. Mm -hmm. So then the economic missions reveal the imminent processions. God, in his sending of the Son and the Spirit, reveals who he is imminently and eternally in his unchanged, dynamic, you might say, communal, processional life. So that's the claim at the beginning. And then the last part of the book, which is the most original, is to follow through on the modern program. Okay, how does the creation reveal the Trinity? How does the incarnation reveal the Trinity? How does the historical life, death, and resurrection of Christ reveal the Trinity? How does the sending of the Holy Spirit reveal the Trinity? These modern guys are all interested in that question because they want to see how does the economic, uh, it, how do the economic events of the revelation of the Son and the Spirit in time reveal who God is? They want to say, in a certain sense, it constitutes who God is yep. eternally. You might say time reverberating back up into the eternity of God and having a, a new qualitative effect on God's identity. Mm -hmm. I do not want to say that. Mm -hmm. What I do want to say is, hey, they have a great idea. How is it that, say, the cross reveals the Trinitarian life of God? So let's look at the incarnation of the cross or the resurrection yep. as a revelation of the, of the unchanged life of the Trinitarian God. How does the Father reveal himself in his crucified Son? How is the Holy Spirit sent forth from the resurrected Christ revealing the inner Trinitarian life of God? So let's get a classical answer to a modern problem. Hmm. And that's where I'm trying to say, look, the classical tradition that we all share as common, you know, baptized Christians, this this common tradition is more powerful to treat this modern problem mm -hmm. than a lot of these post hegelian uh, experimental Trinitarian theologies. We can respond to their questions, which are valid, but we can respond with classical answers, which are perhaps richer and more profound than if we invent new, you might say, Trinitarian ontologies that are innovative and interesting, but often perhaps risk to betray yeah. classical precepts of the faith, including the doctrine of the sovereignty and transcendence of God, the divine unity, uh, the divine eternity, and the immutable identity of the perfection of God. Hmm. Things that Reformed and Roman Catholic uh, Christians should have in common as key concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, and before before this next last question, my assumption is the last five or seven minutes might have gone over people's heads, but what I'm going to say is repeat the last five or seven, because that's I think it's a crucial explanation, especially mm -hmm. for at least for some Protestant reformed um, where we've gone askew, I think in too, too much splitting the economic and the uh, ontological kind of aspects of the, of the Trinity, which leads to, um, and people know the names that I, like, I, I won't say all the names um, that have kind of done this, but um, it's led to some of the problems we, we have in, in theology proper and Christology uh, and our Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, and I think this 
really helped solidify um, some stuff in my mind and and help me understand some of these kind of modern theories like you're you're talking about going back to the classical doctrine uh, and not split because so often I hear well the uh, ontological or kind of the trinity before time is this but it reveals itself this way and they got like not saying it but kind of implicitly saying that like there is some development in the economic trinity versus that the uh, ontological yeah I mean I can say it very mm -hmm. simply you know it's not the case that when Jesus when God became human in Jesus Christ that when God became man that God became a Trinity yeah. or that the Trinity mm -hmm. changed who it was or, you know, the God changed yeah. who he is. It's, it is the case that when God became human in Jesus Christ, God revealed to us who God is. Exactly. Self eternally. Yep. Yeah. Which yeah. people go askew when we assume that it kind of adds something to the Trinitarian nature or it reveals something that wasn't already true before this, um, yeah, which the, is, it was a really helpful chapter and for, for me at least. Yeah, the son, the second person of the Trinity was, uh, there was a pre-incarnate, eternally pre-incarnate. So he was always the second person of the Trinity for eternity. And, and then he also became incarnate as Jesus when he was born of the Virgin Mary. Yeah, yeah. and Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Yeah, exactly. And the, the cool thing about this, I mean, the beautiful doctrine at the heart mm -hmm. of the faith is that the human, that God reveals to us who he is personally in his human nature. So mm -hmm. when we see Jesus being humanly compassionate, being humanly wise, humanly yeah. uh, loving, we're seeing the face of the eternal son of God. Yeah, I love that. Human yeah. nature. That was so yeah. helpful. Yeah, the, that was an incredibly helpful part of the book. Um, I learned, a t it crystallized some of my thought that I, I wasn't sure how to put to words. And you put it to words. Like, I'm just going to read Father White and... Take his, take his, take his understanding as my understanding too. Well, and go back to John one. That's what's so helpful is, is the word became flesh. So he was pre-incarnate God for eternity. This is the second person, the Trinity. And, and Paul's very clear that the exactly. son pre-exists his incarnation. Yes. I mean, if we're, if we're true disciples of St. Paul, we believe that God sent the son into the world. The father has sent his eternal son into the world. Jesus did not become the son of God at his conception. He didn't become the son of God at his baptism or mm -hmm. his resurrection. Those things are revelations in time in a human nature of mm -hmm. who the eternal son is. Yeah. So when we, you know, when we encounter Jesus in the baptism, we encounter the son of God, but he's, he's the eternal son of God who's come into our world. Yep. That's why economically we agree that he was begotten, not created. Yeah, that's that's what it says in the creed, right? Begotten, yes. not made. Begotten, not created. The yes. son was not created. Do you, He's not a creature. He's God. Absolutely. Do you agree? Um, is this is this uh, statement or explanation of the Trinity helpful uh, when it's it's a popular uh, explanation? The Father planned, the Son executes, and the Spirit reveals. Okay, so that I I treat this question in the book. Those are what are called by the classic theology of the church in Augustine and Aquinas and other sources, certainly also in uh, classic reform scholasticism, appropriations. Mm -hmm. So because the Trinity is one God, all the all the works of this is a classic reformed idea as yeah, well as Catholic inseparable idea. operations. They all do the same. Yeah. Yeah. All works of the Trinity odd extra outside itself. Everything God does as creator or save as redeemer is a work of all three persons. Yeah. But. Because each person truly acts and the actions reflect the three persons in different can, – they can reflect the three persons in such a way that we can attribute an action more to one than the other two. Mm -hmm. So we can attribute creation to the Father more perfectly even though he really creates through this, the Word and in the Spirit because mm -hmm. the Father is the primal origin of Trinitarian life from whom all things proceed in God and the creation comes forth from the Trinity, Father, then Son, and Holy Spirit. We can attribute redemption to the son because he's the word incarnate crucified and resurrected in his human nature mm -hmm. who reveals the eternal sonship as the redemption, you know, and the spirit can, we can appropriate or attribute uh, in an appropriate, appropriate way, holiness and charity and grace to the spirit of love because he's sent by the father and the son to redeem and sanctify. But the sanctification and redemption 
also come from the Father and the Son equally mm. because each of these persons is the true and the one and only God. You mm. know, so that's a that's a classic doctrine. It's really important for Trinitarian monotheism. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah and just to just to sum it up, uh, how do you, through your careful research of Aquinas, uh, help us better understand and subsequently worship our triune God? Well, I, you know, I say at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to study the Trinity to know and love the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you, you know, we know and love the Trinity because we're baptized, because we receive the grace of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and through the grace of faith, we know the Father in an intuitive, personal way. We come to know Jesus Christ personally, and we come to know the Holy Spirit personally. That primal intuition of faith is, it's intellectual, but it's also largely affective. It's, you know, it's from love. It goes intellect and love working together. It puts us in personal contact with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a kind of intuitive grasp, but reading scripture and reading scripture prayerfully and theologically allows us to go deeper into that primal intuition of the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to come to know Jesus Christ more deeply in his human nature and his divine nature, come to know the Father more deeply, and come to know the Holy Spirit more deeply. And what you know more deeply, you can love more profoundly. Mm -hmm. So as we grow in knowledge, we can grow in love and holiness. And so there's a deep relationship between uh, study of the scriptures in the tradition and discipleship of seeking to love and worship God in reverence and surrender and trust. You know, so theology, I think the Reformed tradition really understands this very similarly in a way to Aquinas, that yep. theology is at the service of the interpersonal encounter and discipleship, not just for, you know, moral reasons, but because the mind is meant to be configured to the living word of God mm -hmm. in the contemplation and knowledge of Christ. And in the knowledge of the Father and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. So the revelation is like a window to allow us to see into God and therefore to love God more. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice. extremely helpful. Yeah. Well, yeah, Father Wyatt, thank you so much for coming on the show with us, for talking about your book, for your research, uh, helping us better understand um, the triune God through kind of church history onwards. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to kind of talk to our listeners or talk to those who may pick up this book and uh, encouragement or something that you want people to leave with, uh, leave away with after reading this book? Well, I would just say I'm honored and thankful to be here today and that, uh, you know, Catholic and Reformed Christians are, are brothers in the Trinitarian baptism we share and in our devotion to Christ. And that if you want to love the Trinity more deeply, it's important also to study because today we have to have an evangelical culture of learning and teaching mm -hmm. to be able to evangelize and be good witnesses to the depth of the scriptures in ways that are, you know, that, that are plausible to our contemporaries. We have to educate ourselves and then educate others in knowledge and in love. Yeah. So thanks for being, for having me here. And, you know, it's, it's a real honor. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. It's been, been our pleasure. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can keep this uh, reformed Catholic conversation going on. And I know you've, you've had dialogues about this as well. So yeah, thank, thanks for doing this with us. My pleasure. Thank you.